What we do here is go back, 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 back. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good. How are you? Good. I'm Mark. I'm Michael. I'm not an Assassin's Creed. <laughs> so you know. Just so it's no, I am an aspect. Uh, Paul uh, was unable to make it because he's a jet setter. Yeah. 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 Jet setting around the world. Yeah, he's in Japan right now. In Japan. Yeah. He's cooler than us at this moment, isn't he? Clearly. I think you guys are cooler than me. Ah, yeah, yeah, we should yeah, sure yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, hello, good to see you. So, uh, I believe the plan was to make this into more of a general voice acting panel, and voice acting video games, I guess, specifically. Uh, though, if you have any uh, Assassin's Creed questions, of course, they'll be directed to the Yeah, and if you have video games questions, uh, like uh, motion capture to performance capture, I'm also open to those sort of things, because that's something I do a lot of as well. Um, just video games in general, it's, I guess both of us, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we're here to just answer questions, tell you things that you might be of interest in as far as acting or um, anything that interests you and uh, what we do. Now, if we had a moderator, uh, normally they would do intro us and give us a little rundown of our careers, but we'll do that for you, uh, since we don't have a moderator. Mark, tell us something about you. Sure, yeah. So I, I, add, I, do, I do voices in video games, so this is why I get to go to conventions. And uh, the re main reason I get to go to conventions is the original Mass Effect trilogy, in which I played Commander Shepard, and I also played a bunch of aliens in that. In fact, there's some alien species that I play all of in uh, the Mass Effect universe. And uh, so beyond that, I've done a lot of work with Bioware before on their Dungeons and Dragons games, and subsequently when Beamdog took those over with the new Baldur's Gate games that are coming out on the 15th of October, I believe, uh, with a bunch of new content, uh, partnering with Skybound, Robert Kirkman's company. Uh, so they're all that classic stuff. I've been all, all the DLC they did back in the day, plus a bunch of new content. So. It's got to be five or six hundred hours of gaming, I would think, that's in, the, that's in all that combo package. And also with a, a bunch of incentives like the holder dice trays and things like that. So uh, you can look them up. They've got, they've got a bunch of stuff coming out October 15th. I also do a game called Long Dark, which is a uh, ongoing survival game that, uh, funnily enough, I do with Jennifer Hale, female Commander Shepard. And uh, we're the main characters in that. Very realistic survival game about not freezing to death or starving to death in Canada. So. So it's basically player versus Canada. Uh, and, uh, and aside from that, uh, uh, various other games here and there. Uh, let's talk about you, Michael. What about your career in video games? Uh, video games specifically, I started probably 2002 or three with Lord of the Rings, the Third Age. And uh, that was doing motion capture and voice. And I remember getting the job because I was one of the only people who could walk in a room and be a dwarf convincingly. Because I get to physically dwarves. perform and act and walk and talk like a dwarf, and so I remember just like a 22 year old guy and my action, just throwing his voice on and having a blast. Uh, and then I got into more motion capture in other areas, uh, animated things, um, and Max Steel was one of them. I would do a lot of the uh, performance capture for those games, and. Then later got into Watch Dogs, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, I did the majority of the temp voices for the game. So temp voices, when they're making a game and they're doing motion capture, performance capture, you're doing voices for all these different characters and sometimes they might be you and sometimes they're casting other people but you're doing the physicality and performance for those. Uh, and then they're going to have someone else come in to do that. Uh, voices for them as well. Yeah, I did a fair bit of temp voicing on uh, the original Knights of the Old Republic that uh, oh. I worked with, and, uh, and then got replaced by a bunch of guys from LA. So yes, it <laughs> happened. They paid Canadians. Canadians. They paid. <laughs> uh, and also on Mass Effect, actually, I was doing uh, even before I was cast as Shepard, I was doing a bunch of the alien stuff, of course, and then. Uh, during the audition process, they or, or during the process of making the game, they asked me to audition for this man, Shepard. But before that, I'd done some temp dialogue where I'm basically talking to myself in the scene, like having a Salarian bartender being threatened by Shepard and doing both ends of the conversation. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's the kind of things you get to do when you work in video games. Yeah. He's been like all the voices of the aliens, and I've done all the bodies of all the aliens. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had the, the mo cap experience. Yeah. That, uh, Basically, yeah, just throw us together. But yeah, no, it was—it's uh, really fun, and 
And then I did some things with Anthem, and um, I, I guess I can't, I can't even mention it yet. There's two other, a, a game you mentioned that, and some other things that I can't mention because of great, wonderful non-disclosures. Uh, but I'm, I'm, yeah, did Alexios in Assassin's Creed slash Mimos, which is the villain character. If you haven't played it, you could be either um, protagonist or antagonist. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the last two years of my life, and now I'm doing some more games, which you'll hear about soon. You know, but uh, it's it was really really an amazing project to be a part of. And that's kind of where I've been out with the video game world, and kind of bleeding more into that world from other acting areas of my life, which is film, television, and theater. Yeah. So that's us. So that's who we are. And uh, I guess the easiest thing to do is just open it up uh, because we don't have a moderator to ask us questions. Yeah, tell us if, more. unless you have any questions for me. Um, what got you into video games? Uh, I'm auditioned. Yeah. <laughs> I went to a uh, back when Bioware was having the cattle call auditions, as they call them, back in the late '90s. I I did one of those, and I got cast in Baldur's Gate 2, which was my very first voice work for Bioware, and my first video game voice work. Period. Uh, and it was a final uh, in the final cutscene of Baldur's Gate 2. It was one line, uh, so it was one line that you had to beat the entire game to see. So. That, but they kept hiring me after that. So I have a question. Yeah. What was the difference for you when you jumped over from like acting? Because you've done a lot of theater and you've done a lot of uh, comedy and improv and stuff like that. Sure. Just, and even maybe animation. Did you find a difference? I even have a TV show on Amazon Prime, Patty Plastic Man. Did you get that? Okay, I plugged that. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, what would you find the difference for you when you jumped over to the video games? Uh, did you find a difference? Was it drastic? Was it? I didn't find a, a huge difference because I'd done some voice work up till then. I'd done uh, a fair bit of stuff for like CBC Radio and whatnot and, and voice stuff. Beyond that, I also played Dungeons and Dragons. Like I was, uh, I was a dungeon master. Uh, and when you're a dungeon master, of course, you're you're doing all the voices of everything that players encounter. Uh, so going into the Baldur's Gate games, I think that was a real advantage for me. Number one, I knew about just you know voice acting that of course you're having to sell it without any physical presence without the you know the other tools that an actor would be able to use so i, I knew how to approach that but beyond that just being a dungeons and dragons player i think helped when they were doing all those dungeons and dragons games because the bioware guys knew they could just get me put me in the booth and just say this guy's a 12 level paladin and i'd know what they were talking about right uh or i wouldn't be like uh what's a you know this guy's a cobalt shaman what's a, what's a cobalt what's a shaman i already do that i'd be like ah yes they're lawful evil. Uh, so, so yeah, I'd say that uh, my Dungeons and Dragons background did, did help me with those games. Do you find any difference in animation to video games at all? Uh, I would say the, the biggest difference is that in, an, in animation, uh, I don't know how much animation you've done, but you, how much have you done where you've got the rest of the cast in the room? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, it's more like doing a play. And in video games, a lot of the time, you're acting in a vacuum. Uh, even when, like I said, we were doing Mass Effect, uh, Seth Green and Trisha Helfer, they might be booked in for this at the same studio on the same day, but they're waiting in the lobby while the other person does theirs. They're not in the room together. And that's just the way the video games function. Uh, I think it's a matter of scheduling, because usually you have, in Mass Effect's case anyway, you had a big cast that was spread across, you know, three different countries and a couple of different continents. So yeah, scheduling was very, very pretty much impossible. And beyond that, that just seems to be the way that they handle things. They also, you probably have a similar experience. With video games, you never get the script ahead of time. You always, you know, you walk in and you sign your NDA, and then they give you the script. Oh, really? You yeah. had that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. certainly the best effect. Do they give you the Assassin's Creed stuff ahead of time? Uh, well, I would request it, because, I mean, maybe I just had the fortune of being, like, the main character, so I was like, I have to know what I'm saying. But I can't believe they didn't give it to your shepherd and stuff. No, That's well, crazy. they did. We had a, we, both Jennifer Hale and I relied on our directors to give us context. Oh my god. Like that. Okay. But that, that said, we were, <laughs> we were privy to like all the details of the plot. Yeah, but it's still like how, how, and what. But, they, oh but I would we didn't it. know what we were recording from day wow. to day. We'd be like, ah, we think we're doing this, and they'd come in and it's like, no, we're doing these scenes instead. And again, our director is Caroline Livingstone, is the one. Uh, She's lovely. Yeah, yeah I've worked with Caroline. That's great. Yeah. And yeah, you probably worked with all of them. Yeah. Uh, and so she was fantastic, like always giving us context, letting us know. I also had the advantage of being in Edmonton, where Bioware was based. So Mac Walters, for example, was in the room sometimes during my sessions. Oh, okay. Uh, and so we were able to get things like script changes approved on the fly. Like I wasn't changing the plot or anything, but it would be like, ah, can I say it this way instead? This is a bit of a mouthful. And 
because we had to track things so carefully in Mass Effect, we needed Mac there so that he could make that change right away and approve it, and then also make sure that when Jennifer did her session, the exact same changes were made. Yeah, because you did a male-female. Yes, yeah, it could either be male shepherd yeah. me or a female shepherd Jennifer Hale. And, and the same thing, Jennifer, Jennifer recorded first, they had to track any change that was made so that my dialogue was going to match hers. So in, my, in, in our game, we had to not necessarily match, uh, I mean, tone we had to match, but we didn't have to necessarily match the way the other performed their, their lines, but we had to match the timing from end yeah, to the, beginning to end. It, wasn't, it was never about, like, you have to match the first person's delivery exactly, just that it has to be exactly the same dialogue and it has to take exactly the same amount of time. Okay, yeah, so that was a similar, similar yeah. thing, but leeway of your own performance within it. Yeah, yeah. that said, I mean, it was, it was often similar because it's like the same character in the same situation, yeah. it's just that a man and a woman might approach the same this line. So, right. Yeah. Okay, um, I have a very specific question you're going to laugh at. Um, so the goat scene. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Did you have to like motion capture yeah. that? What, how did, what did you use? How my mind. You, your mind? <laughs> that was it? That there was, was it. nothing there? You were just like, yeah, I'm definitely sticking. No, like, I, I literally, it's funny, that, that scene was actually, uh, it's funny enough, I blocked and, like, blocked that scene and, like, made that mime up for, for them. Yeah. Um, to show them, because they didn't know how they would even do it. They're like, a, a, basically, the scene is, I have a guy named Cyclops, he's a stug in the town, and I have his eyeball. Um, and it's missing, so he has a patch over right now, and he, He's, uh, I guess, interrogating um, Barnabas, and and I show up, and I have his eye, which I'm like throwing in the air and catching, and so I did ask eventually because it was hard to do the miming of the this for something that I could use, and they gave me like a golf ball or ping pong, something like ping pong ball to work with, but um, all they had was like. The director wants to stick it up the goat's butt. I was like, amazing! <laughs> That's like the greatest thing you ever. Just mime it, no, like, there wasn't like a standing No, 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 yeah, literally, it was. No, actually, I, I didn't know what the scene was, so I'm like, I can understand why they didn't have an actor doing this. <laughs> yeah, but it, there was nothing there, so yeah, like, we're just the other yeah. actor and I, um, and we had the thing. And, so I did the, there's the ball, which is basically throwing and whatever, and then like the bending down, and then grabbing the tail, the pulling it up, and then the popping it up, <laughs> and then the butt slap. So that's all, it was literally that. It was literally miming the entire um, performance. And, and I sort of blocked it out with them on how the camera would be angled so we could see things a bit so that you wouldn't see the whole, but it, it worked out really well. It, yeah, it really did, it's yeah. very effective. <laughs> That's good, yeah, thanks. That is one of my favorite moments, uh, especially for motion capture to be, because that's like real mime. Yeah, I, I honestly yeah. thought, like, with motion capture and stuff, a lot of the time you have to use your mind, but they'll throw something in, like, here's a box, it's the sheet. Like, stuff like that, so the fact that you did it all just completely mimed is really hilarious to me. Yeah. <laughs> Power of the imagination. No animals were harmed. Yes. <laughs> no CGI animal animals. was totally destroyed. <laughs> Um, we were, they were worried about like how animal activists would be kind of taken aback by a couple of the uh, the animal things in the game. They did have some concerns. And, uh, I mean, it's ancient Greece. That's that was our, I was so happy because plus like that a, animal was made of ones and zeros. So yes, yes. exactly. There was a, there's the the other scene with um, out to the obvious where they go to uh, some young people in the audience, but uh, a fun night of. Sexual missionism? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Um, and there's like a goat runs out of the room and then he goes into the room and he's like, oh, there's another goat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do you play this game? <laughs> I, don't know. I, I spend all my time playing the games I'm in. <laughs> and Fallen. 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 <laughs> we like really, we really wanted to. Sandra and I, and Melisanti, we always aim to bring a lot of humor through. Greeks are very funny, and Greeks are very loud and obnoxious and fun. Um, so we always tried to find ways to infuse humor into what could have been really serious. We took it in really, really funny, and the goats I thought were great because, you know, it's very cliche for Greeks and goats and the whole thing. So I'm glad that. <laughs> They thought people would get offended, and us being Greeks all there, we were like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, this is, we approve, keep going. And, this uh, is perfect. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> no, it was, it was good. Yeah, I'm glad you liked this. <laughs> um, any other questions? I have another one if it feels. Yeah, sure. Very well. Um, yeah. Okay, so You're our moderator. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, okay. I, I literally volunteered on the Tri City page. I was like, if you guys need help, I can help them. Oh, your help is good. <laughs> Lovely. So, um, the wonderful DLC that everybody loved so much. Yes. Um, I didn't mind it personally, I thought it was okay. Um, but that nightmare baby, um, what were your thoughts? Have you seen, have you played the DLC? Yeah, seen I've seen it, I've seen all of it. I mean, yeah. The, the nightmare one with baby. the baby in it, yeah. where you get married. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Why do you call it nightmare baby though? It's because it's horrifying. Like the way it looks? Um, so, it's, first of all, it, has zero motion involved in it whatsoever, so you could swing it like a bat. Um, but I don't. Were you guys just holding the bundle? Was that imagination too? Yeah. It's all. It's all about. Yeah, it's literally. It's yeah, bundle. I keep asking about motion capture because it's fascinating to me. But um, like, I just I don't. If you guys had used like an actual baby, I guess you couldn't have. But I don't know. It might have been less far. There, were, there would probably be insurance. Yeah, insurance. <laughs> Liabilities. No. Um, Really, my just my thoughts were whether you were horrified by it at all when you watched through the DLC or played through it. But I guess not, considering I called it a nightmare. Baby. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I remember seeing that. I remember seeing some things online about people being like, "What's up with the baby?" Uh, so I do remember that. And uh, but no, I, it didn't take me out too much because I, I I'm just seeing past it. I'm trying to focus on the scene yeah. it's about. And yeah, I had I had nothing uh, <laughs> other than a little thing we put in our arms to swaddle, and I pictured my own kid. Um, it was true, like that was hard stuff, but uh, you know, it was a very emotional part of the game, that whole section. And uh, so in the voice booth, I think I was there picturing my wife dying and like Aww. trying to chase after her. Career, and, like, I never cried so much in the voice booth in my career as I did those, like those things. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is an emotional DLC, but that's really me like actually picturing those things and Aww. using that as reference points to like cry and chase after. That's really fascinating actually, yeah. using like specific, yeah, you know, yeah. reference points to you to help with the... Well, it's hard. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, some, I take things from different styles all the time, or I, whatever works. Now when I needed something, because the voice booth is challenging, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you know, it's like you, you've got to find these emotional moments while you're standing in a box with a person through a glass window, and you're, like, you, I can't even imagine not having my lines, but I would get them, say, on a Friday, and we'd start on Monday sometimes, but our scripts would be like three to five hundred page long scripts, once we had a 900 page clip on like a Friday, and I was like, oh good God. Um, and like, you, you barely have time to read, like, how we get, barely have time to get through it. So, doing homework on it is very hard. The most homework you can really do is just really I'm trying to understand where these people are at in this moment. And, and then we have choice wheels, and you, know, you gotta go this way, this way, this way. So, you've gotta figure out how would that person feel this way, this way, and this way. Um, and then when you're in a voice booth, you've gotta deal with decisions like that and emotional things. And do your best to make them somewhat authentic while dealing, you know, within a very inauthentic uh, condition. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I used. Yeah, it was my reference point. So I would just sit there and I'd picture my wife and holding her. It was very painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we do sometimes, you know. That's, that's, that's a way of getting there. That's the moment. And then other things, you, you just find imagination for other stuff. But. You guys brought up the conversation wheel too, because that's a good one for both of you. How does that work behind the scenes? Like going through, do you do it like you do each line of conversation and then you go on to the next set of lines? Or do you follow a whole conversation through and then you do the next options all the way yeah. through? Yeah, with, <laughs> with us, like that's, uh, at least that's the way Caroline uh, would tend to do it. Caroline's smart. Is right. <laughs> and you smart. guys had a director that yes. like, actually was a director. Gone yeah, we, we would tend to do it just like like you said, we would, uh, so in any given scene, uh, it would be, okay, we're gonna do the Paragon path. And so I would go through, there would be some lines of dialogue that would be shared between Paragon and Renegade. And so once we had those, we wouldn't need to do them again. Uh, but uh, the first, it would just be like, okay, we're gonna do the complete Paragon path all the way through, do all the Paragon dialogue. Now we'll go back to the top of the scene, we'll do all the Renegade dialogue all the way through. And as I said, there were some lines that were shared between them, uh, which meant that we had to, sort of walk a fine line in, in terms of your renegade lines couldn't be too angry and your paragon lines couldn't be too calm because there's some people that would go back and forth and if you you know if you went too far in either direction 
you'd sound like you were having these extreme mood swings going back and forth. Uh, and which we ended up having. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, again, that's, that's something that Caroline kept her eye on. And uh, for the most part, uh, the dialogue that, that was shared, uh, you'd do again just for the natural flow of it, even though we'd already recorded. And then, then so you had obviously, you had an experience. Okay, yeah. what, was, what was it like for you guys? <laughs> uh, so we, I had my own voice director in Toronto, and Lanasanti had her own voice director in London, and they didn't communicate. <laughs> Um, so they weren't able to communicate. Oh, it's so different. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really, there's some things there. So if you watch the DLCs, I had to change, I changed my performance a lot to match London style of NPC characters and the tone where Cassandra is being recorded at because I saw that it was contrasting in the main game a lot. And I was like, I'm really loud and brash or big. I'm like, ugh. And so I sound really awkward compared to this other NPC character or the host thing. So I really had to to adjust my performance. We didn't have a director uh, who was like in charge of the acting and the voice acting and this and kept everything in consistency. There wasn't. So it was that was probably my biggest obstacle in that because I was the first one to record uh, for majority of the game. And so the other people did not have your performance to reference. Um, other people did, but London did their own thing, right? And they did their own style, so they uh, they didn't. And I was asked asked to be louder and, and faster, so I ended up going like you know speaking quicker or louder or this and that. And then I watched, and because London's like, hey, wait down here, I sound very different, so I had to. Um, <laughs> so uh, my apologies if you see those moments that I had. Uh, but literally, so I, I watched the scenes from the game, and then I went back as the DLCs continued. And, and really tweak the performance to, to make it match the style. It can stay with consistent with what I was being recording with my director in Toronto, but but flow with what was happening out of the London studio. And, and then in motion capture performance stuff where we did together, Mel and I would just do that stuff together. So any of the cinematics, that's her and I building scenes as much as possible uh, with our on-site uh, director that was there. But that was her and I really crafting the scenes together. So. Those things are, are really works that we did uh, in a room together, which we loved, but it wasn't as often as we would hope. You guys hang out a lot now. <laughs> when we can, yeah, yeah, we're besties, for sure. Uh, I've, I've never had a, a, an experience where another person was acting with in a project and we've become best friends. Yeah. Now, when you guys did Mass Effect, I assumed they were using the beta system. Well, or actually, you were just doing Scratch, so they probably didn't use the beta. Uh, beta is this proprietary system that BioWare has, and it, 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 the acronym actually spells B-A-D-E-R. Uh, but it turns out somebody owns the copyright to that word, uh, so they can't actually call it that, so they call it Beta instead of B-A-D-A. And essentially, that's a system where if you, if you happen to be like the last person to record in the scene, you'll have everybody else in the scene in your cans while you're recording. And basically, as like your lines are coming up on the screen or the iPad, uh, all of the dialogue is firing in your ear, so you've got everybody's performance, and you're able to. You know, oh wow! Uh, no, that's cool. And it is a proprietary <laughs> system, so that's yeah, why yeah. Ubisoft probably didn't have it. But no, uh, didn't have that. Yeah. The uh, the really cool thing about that is that it's not. It, it's almost as good as having everybody in the group with you. Uh, if you are the first person to record, you've got the advantage of, like, say, set a tone. You set the tone, and then everybody else has that to refer to, and and they'll be able to. You hopefully not have that thing of like... Which is what I thought was going to happen. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the first three months, I didn't even have a voice director. Right. Um, what? So, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, wow. You were the director. I was. Do what you want. Yeah. Yeah. No joke. Like, I was, and all I had to reference point was the other games. So I went back and I started watching other games and sort of seeing how it was. And I think Origins had just released like when I was a couple months in. and um, So I had Ezio, which I really liked. I was like, I like his style. So I kind of based a bit of it off what I, I, I saw with him. Because it was Italian, it was closer um, culturally uh, where it was, and I liked his tone. So I took that, and then when Bayek came out, I was like, okay, no, he's playing it like super, like, um, dramatic in a way, which I thought was cool too. So it was like the different styles, which uh, that's the way I was trying to make it kind of stylistically um, stay consistent to the franchise a bit. And, uh, and then the rest was just whatever I, I thought about the character. And because uh, Mel didn't even, Mel was a little bit, after I was hired, she got hired because she was doing chemistry reads for a few months. 
um, with other actresses till we found her. And uh, so I'd already started a, in a bit on the course booth and on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to say <laughs> oh, good question over here. Um, Typically, I find when people play video games, they like to pick when they have a choice, either a male or female character. When you guys are playing video games, did you pick one side or the other? Like you had the option to be female Commander Shepard or male Commander Shepard, or oh, when when doing the playthrough? Oh yeah, when you actually play well, I'm such a narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in a way, it was sort of like it was my way to review my work as well. Like when you know once. Before we played, we did started recording Mass Effect 2, I made sure to do complete Renegade and Paragon playthroughs of 1. And then before we did 3, I did complete uh, playthroughs of 2. Uh, so, you know, I, and Jennifer's fantastic. She's one of the best uh, voice actors in North America, and certainly one of the busiest. Uh, so, uh, of course, I would love to see her performance, but I, I did kind of have to review my work, too. So, yeah. Yeah, That's, that, that would be a great Let's Play if you recorded yourself. Yes. Played Jennifer's character, right? And then, and then muted it, yes, and did all the vocals yourself. <laughs> there is also, I don't know if you played the Citadel DLC. Where uh, uh, is it okay if I give spoilers for the Citadel DLC? It's been out for like a billion. Years. It's been out for a billion. Years. Yeah. So there's a, there essentially it, it's the final DLC of Mass Effect, uh, and one of the things, one of the plot points is that Cerberus has created an evil clone of Commander Shepard. Uh, and when I went in, again, because I never saw anything before we were actually there, it's like, oh, wow, this is great. Hey, do you guys ever think of, what if Cerberus had reversed the X and Y chromosome so that male Commander Shepard fights an evil Femme Shep and female Commander Shepard fights an evil male Shep? And they're like, yeah, it's already written. That's just a... <laughs> so, so I'm still hoping that one day some fan goes in and just recuts the Citadel DLC with two different oh, playthroughs. Yeah, like and then that. you could probably have male and female Shepherd fight each other. That's uh, now, when you guys record, and sometimes you record multiple characters for the same project, uh, do you get all your lines from one character in a row, or do you ever have a moment where it's like Mel Blanc and you're talking to yourself in the booth recording? Generally, they would record, like, I do, so, so there's several scenes where that happens. Like there's, for example, in the Citadel DLC, there's a scene where Shepard finally meets Blasto, and I don't know if everybody knows, but I play Blasto, because he's a hammer, so I do all of their voices. And there's also a Vorcha in the scene, and I'm all of the Vorcha that you see. So there's like a scene with, you know, Blasto, Shepard, and a Vorcha, I'm doing all of the dialogue. So we generally do, okay, we'll lay down all of Shepard's dialogue, great, we've got that. Now I do all the Vorcha's dialogue, and I've got my performance as Shepard firing in my headset as I'm doing the Vorcha, and then Blasto last, so. You know, the Vorcha, that had to kill your voice. <laughs> it, oh, it did. Yeah, I didn't employ any, you know, secret technique. I just screeched as loud as I could with, like, a mouth half full of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, just Can you to, show us that? Like, what that yeah. looks like? Yeah. I'm not going to go full out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a worse screen. Yeah, but it was even worse than that. Much worse. That was like at about 25%. Uh, and sorry, just to answer the last bit of your question, uh, and also when I do like a Mass Effect playthrough or actually any game like Fable or Knights of the Old Republic that lets you do the good evil choice, uh, I always do my evil playthrough first. And then when I do my good playthrough, I feel like I'm redeeming myself for being such a jerk the first time through. Especially like in Fallout. It's like, yeah, I destroyed Megaton in Fallout 3 for a. I, I nuked to town to get a nice apartment. Uh, but then, you know, and then I was very good on my next place. Nice. The question I was going to, I think, respond actually to you um, said on your side was the, we didn't have the, the clean throughs on choice wheels. So sometimes we would literally be at one beginning of the choice and then we jump to the end of the scene you know, over here. And then sometimes you go to a different scene and then you come back and you're at this part of the choice wheel. Sometimes we got to do one choice wheel through, which is great. I was like, oh, great. And then I was like, are we going to go back and start the next one and go through? But no. OK. Uh, so it was really hard to find the flow. So I'd really have to map in my mind where we were. And then when we came back to it, I was like, okay, how was that moment that we would lead to this? Um, and that was really challenging. Um, because you're getting out like hundreds of lines a day, so yeah. it was it was just hard to map those kind of things to keep it consistent. Because like you said, it does have it can't be too crazily different because you could go do all the different choices, and if you like this way, this way. I mean, I watched some and some of the God choices were hilarious to me, where he's like really, he's like, wow, it's me now, and it's like, very, <laughs> <laughs> it's, like it's like okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's <laughs> especially because that you didn't have like say a Caroline Livingstone to keep track of. Yeah, 
It was. It was. Uh, it was a big obstacle on, on that front for sure. Um, and then the some of the things that made it really challenging. We didn't get to perform together in the voice booth, which I really wanted. Her and I really fought for an opportunity to do this. It's the dialogues, especially with Nemo's uh, Alexios, Nemo's Cassandra, uh, doing those scenes together that weren't the cinematics, and. We beg, but the style of programming they use can't have us, I guess, in the same room at the same time. That was their reasoning. Yeah, we did um, some experimentation, like right at the very beginning. Uh, they flew me down to LA and we tried doing some scenes with more than one actor in the booth. Yeah. But it was just like the sound lead, and it was just like, no, this is going to take way longer and it's going to be more cumbersome. So, yeah, they, they ended up going, going with uh, recording all of this separately. And that was, that was even before, like, because I think I. I recorded with some other actress who didn't end up playing Ashley you know, okay. in the game, but it was just, again, it was just all figuring it out. This was before they had beta and lockdown and they'd, they'd figure everything out. A lot of it is, is, is like the companies, video game companies, just sort of like, let's see how this works. Okay, how about this? Okay, this seems to be working. This is what we'll use for the rest of this game. Yeah. Even though it's not very supportive toward the process of acting and uh, connection. And you know, and that, that's a hard thing to find with, with those kind of moments. So uh, some of the Nemo stuff, it was literally me recording Alexios and then replaying Alexios and doing all of Nemo's lines. And then Mel would have to do both in the way I created them or the way we are. my director was, and I uh, directed me to, to do it. And I thought that was disappointing for me. Uh, just because, one, I never got to feel, she never got a chance to actually give her performance back to me. And even if we just rehearsed it together, it would have been amazing so that we could have created how the dynamic would flow. And yeah, it was for me a missed opportunity that I would have loved to have seen. But they gotta be extra for rehearsal. So <laughs> even in the same day, I don't mind. It would have just been like, just running through it together. And then you go first and then you go second, even from the same, you know, I'm in the outside of the booth. Just to record it in the same space uh, would have been great. So we could have really uh, built things together, especially because the characters were the same person, and yes. all of that kind of stuff together. I, I really thought that would have benefited uh, the performances. That I'm sure that they, they ended up being fine. I just know as an actor where you go, this could have been a lot more um, connected, and uh, just a lot more play that she would have brought out of it that I couldn't in those moments that she would have given me and such, you know, back and forth. So. Um, the way I can usually. The way I can usually. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the limitations of the voice booth, but hopefully they'll start getting more understanding of that and building more of an infrastructure towards playing. Because animation does it, mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier because you're listening in the moment. This person said this this way. Good, now I can respond to that in that way and, and continue from there. And other times in video games, you're kind of flying blind. So that can be a challenge, especially when you don't have a Caroline. Yes, yeah. and yeah, it's always better when you're in the room with your fellow performers, and it's more organic, and it's just, it has more life. Uh, would you, from your own individual experiences, would you say you have more creative control maybe in a different medium like like theater or film than compared to a video game? Uh, it depends on uh, what kind of theater. Like, for example, I just did a fringe play that I wrote myself and uh, I'm, I act, I was, it was a one-man show, I'm the one person in it. I did have a director, but uh, yeah, I had a lot more creative control over that because I could do whatever I wanted. Uh, as soon as, you know, there's a, a large corporation involved, uh, there's going to be a lot more checks and balances in what actually happens. And ultimately, when you're hired for a video game voice game, whatever voice game, uh, you're, you're there to serve the writers, uh, to tell the story that they want to tell, to uh, work with your director, to uh, uh, be the outside ear and the outside eye, in the case of theater or whatnot. It's ultimately... <clears throat> You, the, the, the more people are involved, the less control you have. Right. Uh, but a lot of things like TV, and especially video games, are a very collaborative art form. In fact, I'd say video games is the most collaborative art form because, you know, if I was doing a TV show and I went, okay, there's a bottle on the table, it's great, okay, so we have props bring in that bottle. In video games, it's like, okay, we have to build this bottle out of ones and zeros, like right. I said earlier. Right. And, like, everything that you see has been created by a team of people. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd say yeah. There's definitely less creative control in video games than than through. That's a good point. Motion capture, I'd say I have the most creative control uh, in the 
motion capture studio, and most teamwork uh, environment is in the motion capture studio. So they're they're a company that is always there. They're the same teams that are building all the games you play, and so they're really a family. And when you come in and you work with them all the time, you literally become like this really cool family, and you all work together, and you're all having a blast. And so I I think, in my opinion, one of my favorite performance places is you know, it's the the performance capture studio because you get to work with everybody, um, and yeah, not necessarily as much in the in the voice booth as much creative control, I guess. But uh, yeah, and it also depends on your directors for theater. Sometimes the director might have a vision that is completely not what you have in mind, and uh, same goes for TV. You know, you just hope TV's hard. TV's to me, TV's the hardest because it's all about you know, either the leads and their story, and then you're fitting into all of that somehow, and you're just basically a line speaker. Yeah, so you're just like the missing piece, and you just have to be... Yeah, so try and, and do it creatively. Like how much creative control you have on the project. Like, yeah. so, if you happen to be an executive producer on the project, then yes, you have a lot more right. creative control. So. Absolutely. And I've, I've been in that position, but uh, a lot of the times, if you're, say you're just, you know, auditioning for a role, and like, say, I don't know, let's say you're doing a guest spot on Murdoch Mysteries, you do not have a lot of artistic control. Of course, yeah, yeah. Right. And so that's kind of it. If you're like, you know, a lead in a, a feature film, like you're gonna have a lot of say the director hopefully builds that character uh, together to create something. It, it all there's there is kind of like a hierarchy that comes with the roles you are as well and what say you have, um, for sure. Then again, like say if you're somebody famous who's just coming in to do a little guest spot on a show that you're kind of doing like you can pretty much do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, but we were fortunate enough to have Alan Vick come on to our show uh, as a guest uh, before he passed, and he, you know, it was literally like whatever Mr. Vick wants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for video games, uh, does like the success or failure of a game like affect your like acting career really, or do you like definitely affect it? Uh, I mean, speaking personally, the fact that Mass Effect was a huge success is like, yeah, that, that really did help. That helped a lot. Uh, I don't know if you'd necessarily be punished for a game not doing well, but it would just be more like, oh, nobody heard about that game. So it'd be, it would be more like, oh, that's a wash. Uh, I can't think of any video game where it's like, that guy was in that game, never hire him again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. If you're doing, um, if a game sucks, it's not, they won't necessarily blame the performers, uh, in my opinion. Like, so. on Mickey Rourke did that, uh, that first person shooter, Rogue something, that nobody remembers, and... I don't remember it, so yeah, I it, it, it went from, like, the $80 price point to, like, three bucks in, like, a week. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I didn't do well. He basically just mumbled the entire time. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> just Mickey Rourke showed up with his dog and then just... Uh, <laughs> that was the game. <laughs> I didn't. I missed that one. That's right. Okay. okay, so I guess it kept for him destroying. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know if Mickey did many video games after that. No. I mean, performers can make a game, though, and I think that's you know you, you can really fall in love with the character that can really stand out. Um, I think Odyssey people really liked Cassandra and Alexios a lot, which has made a big difference. Uh, in, because it's this game has really been a, a lot about the story uh, element more than about like just going around. And, Assassinated and killing people—that is part of it. But it's, I think, this one had a very big storyline. Uh, you know, playing either one, I think you're about the family and the dynamic and that kind of have a resolution of what all that is. So I, I think, yeah, the performances can make a huge, huge difference to it. But yeah, I never thought about uh, someone absolutely bombing a game, <laughs> especially someone with a. Oh, I remember that. Bethesda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't mention it. Nope. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, so this is mostly for you, but you were in Andromeda, so like a little bit yeah. for you. So as being somebody who is so intimately involved in the creation of the Mass Effect universe and everything sure. in it and stuff, what would you say was the most beautiful part of the games? Like in terms of just like overall how they are, what was your favorite, like most impactful part? about those games? Well, I mean, from my point of view, like the most impactful part was like how it was embraced by fans. And the fact that Bioware, I mean, I, I, I got to be in on the game from like the concept art stage. Like even before I was cast as Shepard, I was brought in to do alien sound sets and just like, okay, what does a baseline Solarian sound like? What does a baseline Krogan sound like? All these things. So I got, to, I got to see it being built from the ground up. And it was such a fully realized 
universe. Like they, you know, you could just play through the game and not read any codex entries if you wanted to. But if you did, it was such a rich experience, and they had so much lore and everything had been thought out. So that just the intricacy of the world they created that was that was really something, and I think that's why it was embraced by fans. And then you had these great character moments, and you had NPCs that the fans could really invest in and actually like feel, feel like they had like a full relationship with. Them. Kate, yes, yeah. and depending on, on who you pick, like Liara and Garrus and all these characters, and, you know, the Krogan, Grunt and Rex, and Legion, Fane, everybody. Like these people really invested in these characters, and it was a combination of great writing, really great performances uh, by the whole cast, and uh, the fact that they, they did actually play it out, especially again, I'll go back to the Citadel DLC for that sort of emotional closure. Uh, with all the characters too, so yeah, that's that's something that I really like about this. I think um, same thing I like about Odyssey was that they were both willing to embrace, uh, at least in Andromeda, the open sexuality of the people, uh, whether you're so straight, gay, bi, whatever yeah. it was, and I think the the fact that games were willing to open up into that realm kind of brought the horizon of video games and gives people a place where they can feel comfortable and safe as they are and those sort of things. So I, I actually really, really like that the game's opened that element up. Uh, and I, I appreciated that a lot. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's why the, the, the players and the, the fans really invested because they could see whatever kind of relationship they had or, or wanted themselves reflected in the game. Like as a queer person playing like Mass Effect and like Odyssey and stuff like that, like I played through the first two Mass Effect games a million times, and um, I did a male chef playthrough, and I was like, well, femme chef, I kept going after Caden, and I was like, I'm going to do it with male chef too. Wait, I can't. And the third game came out, it just was so, like, it was everything I wanted. And I don't know if you know, uh, uh, we we recorded like dialogue for Male Shepherd Caden relationship like right from the first right game. Right from the beginning, yeah. And uh, a bit, and then it got cut from the game just for time, ultimately. Yeah. Uh, but that all that code and all those recordings still existed in the game, and so like some enterprising fans went in and like pulled unlocked it all out, it. unlocked it, and basically yeah. built like the, the all the scenes, which wow, I think really? are all up on YouTube. I'm a console gamer, so I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can watch the YouTube yeah. videos. Yeah, huh. there's um, they did it. Yeah, they're very really industrious as well with wow. Cullen, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it's all coded in the game too, and there were a few line recordings and like the same thing. It was cut because like it didn't really quite fit in with the timing and the style and whatever. But it's I don't know. It's something I've noticed with like games like this, especially like ones that you make your own choices and you really become involved with the characters. That like having those options for yourself, like again, as a queer gamer. Like having those options open to me means so much, and like, like you guys getting to be involved in the making of that and stuff is really awesome. <laughs> yeah, we, I agree. Certainly, do. I mean, I had to mocap some of those scenes. So. <laughs> 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 Tell us more. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get to do any mocap, so I did not. I did not get you to cuddle with Raphael. Didn't feel the Yeah. I just sat in the booth. Yeah. No, I, I, now on your playthroughs, who did your romance? On my play, let's say, okay, so my Paragon uh, romance, uh, Liara, and then Tali. Uh, and then my Renegade romance, Ashley, and then Miranda. And uh, the only reason I switched loyalties, romantic loyalties, was because I knew that both uh, Ashley and Liara in Mass Effect 2, they weren't party members. Like, you met, you ran into them, but they, they weren't like controllable party members. So. Uh, I had inside knowledge, so I was just like, ah, I want to be able to see the other things. Uh, Courtney Taylor has told me that I have to do a Jack romance at some place. Please through. do. Yes, yeah. and I love Courtney. Don't Courtney's fantastic. <laughs> she is an awesome, awesome lady. Uh, so I have to, at some point, do a playthrough where I romance John. If I had to, I didn't play uh, Mass Effect, but it probably would have been John and Gil Brody uh, out of like, the male characters. And uh, I guess Odyssey. I mean, I, Al Hibiades was the best romance in the game. <laughs> 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 and then I think, um, I'm trying to remember who it was, if it was Roxana or not. Um, but there was a female warrior, and Xenia. Uh, that's the female character I really liked. Well, if you do uh, Dragon Age, 
Mm -hmm. Iron Bolt. Iron Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> Which was Freddy Prince Jr. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, is there a question in the back? Um, yeah. Yes. yes. How do role playing games work? Like, is it if it's like a play or something? Like, how do role playing games work? Are you talking about tabletop role playing games or? I like video games. Oh, okay. So for like, how do they work in terms of uh, how they're like the script looks or? Yeah. Generally, yeah, they like they are scripted out. Uh, the, the script that I see is like sort of play dialogue. Like you've got basically this character says this, but because you have different options, especially in like the, in the Mass Effect games, there'll be this character says this, and then there'll be four branches. So it'll be you say this, or you say this, or you say this, or you say this, and. The dialogue that can then branch out differently. So, like when we originally started doing it, we used paper scripts like on the first Mass Effect game. And like by the end of the week, there'd be like in the recycling bin, there'd be a stack like that. Uh, so they were very environmentally conscious when they switched over to just using screens because that made it a lot simpler. You didn't have to have like multiple sheets for a thing. It would just be like, okay, we're choosing this, and then it would just you know, the screen would just change. So uh, do you have hashtags do you, like hashtag uh, sad or vulnerable or uh, happy. Or uh, we they used uh, just in brackets actually. Yeah, in the brackets. Just be like you know angry or okay. like sort of like stage direction. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was kind of written out like that. It gives like, you like an idea of what they want um, this this line to, to, to say, how they want it said when they do the brackets. Yeah. Um, the other thing I learned was when in my game, the AI that they are going to program to move the body a certain way. That's what it's for the hashtags for us was um, there's a bracket hashtag, what it is. And they'll basically, that hashtag will be input into computer. So the body, the animated body, will do that gesture. Um, so if it's angry, it'll do whatever, it'll do its thing that some human created a while back. And they have a library of movements. And, um, so you're saying the line that it was referenced, you know, angry, or so you're going to say it a bit angry, and then they'll add that into the computer, add in that hashtag angry, and then the body is going to do something to give it movement in that direction. Interesting. Yeah, we didn't, it. we didn't have any of the hashtags. So the, yeah. I think, I mean, at, on rare occasions, we'd have animatics, uh, but usually it was only for, like, really complex scenes, mm -hmm. where it's just like, you need to know where you are in this space and what's going on. For the most part, it was, uh, it was, you know, you might get a look at a still image or things like the that. Animatics in the voice movie? Yeah, so oh, that's awesome. But again, yeah. only only for very con and it was like usually, you know, the sort of pylon men. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like those things. Yeah, they still give me a great idea of what's happening. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and again, it was just for complex scenes where it's like, okay, so you guys are down here, they're forty feet up a cliff, and then this happens, and then you end up here. So just so you know what volume to do things at, or just so you knew what was going on in the scene. Which we'd have to do on the mocap stage, we'd get stuff like that, or now they're building where you can actually stand in the room and see where you are, which is slowly being implemented. So that's really cool, but. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. for the most part, we laid down dialogue and then they did mocap along with it. Rather yeah, than sometimes I remember we'd listen, yeah. and once in a while we'd get to listen to the voices and act as if you're them, give physicality to that voice, um, which is neat. Okay. Either of you guys have to do like Foley voiceover work or stuff like Frank Welker would do for um, inanimate objects or, or anything in the booth. Like if you had to, just like clunk. Yeah, or like speaking yeah. speak to a fan or something to get a certain effect. Or well, all like I said, I did do yeah. my mouth flat half full of water for the voice. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just me. Uh, it was like, eh, this might be an interesting sound. Like the first time they got me to do a voice. Uh, and I, I was initially just going to be doing that one Borcha, and then they came back to me and said, yeah, we really like what you did for the Borcha. We don't want to force any other actor to have to do what you did, so can you just do all the Borcha? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Um, no, I've done fully, I've done, I, I've built libraries of movement uh, for all those AIs. I've done that. I guess that's sort of the new digital age. <laughs> yeah, like you have to gesture right, look right, look left, your hands on hips, stand up, and this was you do this, sort of, and then you gesture background. Of all these people you see going on in the background who are doing things, drilling stuff, having conversations, like old people, young people, um, we have to basically change our physicality to these different styles of characters, and then they build libraries and libraries and banks of, of physical movements. 
uh, and some will go into the background characters and some will go into the AI characters of the leads that when they don't want to do cinematics because they're expensive. So they just kind of fit that in. It's really so you ever worried they're going to build up enough of a library that you never get a call again? <laughs> yeah, we've got all the sounds. If you want an sounds. honest and truth, truthful opinion, I, I do think some companies are, would scrap cinematics altogether if they had the opportunity to, which is disappointing because you'll never get a real humanistic experience that, that only the human will create and make up in that moment. And uh, I, I hope that they don't. I really do, even though I know it saves a lot of money. Uh, in answer to your question about Foley, I, I haven't really done it myself. I have done Walla sessions, and Walla sessions are always fun because you're literally doing like, this is all the background verbal that will be happening at the tavern, things like that. Like you can literally, as long as you're not too loud, you can literally talk about anything. It's, some, it's sometimes a good way to just fit little in jokes or things like that. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you, but the thing is, people go in and they, they can pull that stuff out and listen to it now. So you actually want it to be something that if somebody did pull that out, oh, it still makes sense. It still makes sense in the world. But I, uh, when I did my Walla sessions, uh, we came in at the tail end of them doing Foley stuff. And it was just a bunch of guys from Bioware with like sword, this was for Dragon Age, and they were just like smashing swords together, taking a shield and hitting it with an axe and a sword and a mace, just to, for the different sounds that the weapons were making. So. so basically the same stuff they were doing since like the Three Stooges. Just yeah, yeah, basically just like, now I'm walking through the cornstarch snow. Like, yeah, everything's recycled. Yeah, there's nothing. <laughs> and they still use uh, the Wilhelm screen. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that's just amazing. I thought that just from film school. Like, this is the effect, and you can hear it. Once you've heard it, like, yeah, it's in every movie. You hear it forever. Yeah. Right. Have you had to do a lot of voice matching, like for other actors and stuff? I myself have not done a lot of voice matching. Uh, I've uh, uh, mostly, I've, it's been characters I've created, so. Sometimes you sort of want, it's like, we'd really like it to sound like this character, or especially like for comedy sketches. Uh, oh, come to think of it, yeah, okay, so on CBC Radio, we did a long-running thing called The Irrelevant Show, uh, and we had to do impressions sometimes. And I'm not really an impressionist. Most of my impressions are super obscure, like Paul Lind and Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, but occasionally, they, they would just be like, we need you to be James Dyson in this scene, the guy who invented the Dyson vacuum cleaners. Here's, Here's some infomercial stuff. Watch him and then try to match his voice. Uh, but again, it wasn't it wasn't proper voice matching where it's just like, oh, okay, we need you to pick do some pickup lines for that. Have you done much voice matching? Yeah, I've done quite a bit actually, just considering I'm like, wow, I'm surprised. But uh, I guess the, some people trust me to change my voice. Uh, I've, yeah, I've done a, not on video games as much, more on commercials. Uh, I did do an Old Spice whole campaign ad. The guy had his accent was too thick. So I did voice match him with a lighter accent. And uh, it was really awesome, but really challenging. Yeah. You know? And he had such a great voice. There was uh, yeah, a lot of commercial stuff. I had to do Liam Neeson, Al Pacino, a uh, bunch of people to like voice match their styles and cadences. And then in the, I did some wall of stuff where you end up like, can you match that person to them? And so I have done things like that as well. Uh, so it's pretty, yeah, it's fun. It's challenging, but it's fun to see how people talk and how their voice tone is, how to change your voice to, to sound like that person uh, for a brief bit. Well, yeah. time, time does fly, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah, we got, yeah, we got like probably enough time for a question or two. Uh, yes, so one, one, two, okay. Sure, um, if you guys had to pick a role that you would want to do to replace someone else from any movie, video game, what would it be? Oh, snap. Any role, <laughs> any role. Yeah. Any vocal role. Yeah. Just vocal role. It could be like a live action. Like. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. I'd like to be in an Oscar winning movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's who? Okay, I'll, I'll keep it to the nerd realm. Just in the nerd realm sure. uh, and uh, video game animation. Uh, I'm a huge Doctor Doom fan. I love Doctor Doom always. He's the best super villain as far as I'm concerned. And uh, at least in film, they haven't quite got it right yet. But hopefully, there have been some great animated Doctor Dooms, but uh, and video game Doctor Dooms. But uh, yeah, just uh, just to be able to say that I got to play Doctor Doom once, I would love that. Dang, I was like, yeah, I'm really thinking about. It. I know there's two, one character I'm going to play, okay. and you can talk about it, I can't talk about it yet. You can write it down, but it's coming out. <laughs> It will be coming out probably in the next six months or so, and so I got my dream role. Uh, is it a movie? It's already yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, video game? It's with. Oh uh, yeah, it's a video game. Cool. Yeah, and. Um, Can you use it company? 
can write it down, but he can't show us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, if you follow me and stuff like that, you'll know as soon as I can, I can let it out. Um, and then, uh, but there's one character I want to play that hasn't been created yet, and that's like, but as far as people who've done stuff, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any one role that I would like, I had to, I wish that was. What's the character that hasn't been created? Uh, Craven the Hunter. Oh, I see. Then I want to play Craven the Hunter um, in a live action. Yes, yeah, so we've not seen him in live action, he's been yeah. in animation. Yeah, yeah. But I would love, animation, but yeah. I'd love to play him. Uh, oh, actually, and yes, we have. Uh, we'll go to this guy, then we'll give you the last word. I've so. had too many. So Don't worry, no, not at all. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Uh, what happened to Paul Amos? Paul, uh, Paul, uh, you might have missed that at the beginning of the session. We discussed uh, Paul's jet-setting lifestyle. Yeah, in Tokyo, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and as as things uh, often happen, uh, some work came up. So yeah, he's working on another project. Came in a little late. So. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's working on another project. Yeah, uh, he's well, so. he's gallivanting, probably eating sushi. Yeah, and some ramen the other day. And some ramen, yeah. <laughs> Always the best question. Oh yes, his, Paul's Instagram will tell you all the details. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Feel free to stalk him through his Instagram. Um, <laughs> so I just want to add on to this question earlier about like sound libraries and movement libraries and stuff. Um, when you were creating like, I, I don't know how else it is, like grunts and like moans and stuff. Well, yep. but how does that come about? Do they just give you a list of what they want or are they Basically. like, hey, do this and then you kind of do it? It's like, at the end of the day usually. <laughs> Unless they're new people's coming in and be like, let's start with all the Onos. And you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very respectable to realize, no, we don't want them tiring up their voice, uh, doing all this screaming and grunting. Uh, so usually it would be at the end of the day, and we would we called it an exertion talent. And so it would be like all of the hits and the pain grunts and the uh, exertion things and whatnot. That would all be at the end of the day. And you'd usually do like maybe once a week, you you do a bunch of exertion stuff, uh, and then once they have it, they they pretty much. Yeah, just they have a library catalog. Yeah, yeah, like you all the stuff in, in Odyssey. Like we have to do every yell, and you do levels. You know, start low, medium, go up to high. Every every hit, and then breathing. So you have the then you go into running, and then you go into like archery, and you literally had to go like. And you have to do all these different styles of breath and all these different styles of and stuff to like... for the pain, uh, I assume it's, it's probably similar in your game, uh, yeah. they would do things like, okay, now you're getting hit. So, yeah. so you do like, okay, big, small hit, big hit, great big hit, whatever. But then also there would be things like, okay, now you're being hit by something that's on fire. Okay, now you're being hit by something that electrocutes you. Now you're being hit by something that freezes you. Yeah. yeah, all these. And like, okay, now try getting hit in the stomach. Get hit in the shoulder. Get hit in the, like so. They have different areas of the body, so they have different sounds coming out of you. And, um, yeah, it's a lot. Did they ever just be like, "Hey, like you mean to sound like this? No, you're not doing it right. Let me kind of hit you." And with that, I believe we are at the end of our panel. Thanks you. So thanks so much, folks, for coming up. Uh, this has been the Assassin's Creed panel. Yes. <laughs> So you know, I believe that in one hour from now at 5.30, I'll be hosting the cosplay conference.